like to talk about how we interpret um, the flow speeds uh, in, from a stratigraphic column and the water depth and how I want it marked uh, for the projects. So I've taken a few selections from the various example stratigraphic columns and I want to just give an example uh, for each one. So if we look at, at flow speeds, the black here is coal. We have trough cross stratification, planar cross stratification, ripple cross lamination, root casts, um, and then shale at the top. So if we're just taking this part, the flow speed for a coal, which forms often in a marsh, is, is really slow. So I would mark that part of the column as being slow. That's also true for the mud settling out at the top. So those are slow or the slowest in the column. We know that the trough cross stratification comes from sinuous dune crests uh, and the planar comes from uh, straight dune crests and the trough cross stratification occurs at faster flow speeds than the planar and there's also a decrease in grain size. So if we just take this little part of the column, the fastest, it re the lowest part represents the, the fastest flow in the column. And as the grain size decreases and we go from dunes to ripple lamination, the flow speed uh, goes down. So you could draw something like this. The upper part is, is about the same. So basically at the base of the channel, there might be some erosion there because channels often um, migrate laterally. So we could draw in the jump in flow speed if we wanted there. And then we have plants and the um, a mudstone on top that represents another abrupt change in flow speed. So the causes of the abrupt change here at the bottom would be channel migration. And at the top, it could also be uh, the opposite, sort of going from a channel to a floodplain, or possibly the mudstone is in an, ox, um, in an oxbow lake. So it could be um, floodplain, uh, oxbow uh, formation. Right. If we look at the next example, um, this represents uh, a diamygtite. Uh, we have some rippled sands and we have some uh, shale with drop stones in it. So uh, you get diamygtites um, uh, these are from ice, which I think those of you with a section have interpreted. Um, and the ice is very low flow speed, and it also is a very low flow to settle mud out from suspension. So I'd accept that either one of these, either the diamygtite or the isolated pebbles and mudstone would be the slowest flow speed. I'm going to make the ice, ice is often really slow moving. So I'm going to say that in this part of the column, the ice is the slowest, uh, but the mudstone is very slow. But then we have these two sandstone beds with some ripples. So that requires like a medium flow for those, those two beds. And then it's not quite lined up. There's a little bit of sandstone in here um, before you go back, back to the ice. So this could be a representation of the flow speed for this section of the column. Uh, if I was just looking at this part, the fastest flow is probably where there are ripples. Um, so you could, you could mark that or not. Um, the ripples show two directions of flow. So this sort of change in flow speed uh, between those, so like all of these spots here, I could say represent uh, tide changes as the cause. 
um, and then going up into this one, it would be um, uh, ice advances. So you end up with that very low flow. If we take a look at this example, um, we have uh, some beaches, we have some scour marks, we have some storm deposits and ripples uh, in general. Um, and then we have roots at the top. So to form the plants, we have to have the low flow speed. So right at the top represents the lowest flow. Um, often in the, in the uh, sort of breaker zone, which these scour marks represent, we have a very fast flow and it's, it's coarse grained on the beach, so we need to have a fast flow there. So we can make a uh, fast flow sort of for all of this. And as the grain size declines, we go down to a lower flow speed here. Okay, so this is a case where the flow speed uh, is a gradational change except right at the top. And we could say this would be uh, a change in environment. Causing that, you could say specifically what it is, like going from the beach to uh, vegetated as dunes or areas like that. But in this case, the, the flow speed, the grain size change is variable, and so this uh, is variable smoothly, so the flow speed is um, uh, variable in the same sort of way. Okay, Here we have some storm deposits, and there's this one bed that's a whole lot coarser, so that's definitely the fastest part of the flow and the speed in this area, particularly the erosion at the bottom and the flow speed goes down through time. And uh, to sort of the average storm speed, and there's none of the shale preserved here. Um, uh, so if you, there was some shale in here, if I draw it in here, then we would have the, the lowest uh, flow speed with the shale, right? So, so we could have two examples both this jump in flow speed and this jump in flow speed are due to uh, a storm, um, you can say sort of peak storm currents and waves. All right, so the storm advances and um, causes these, these jumps in flow speed. Now, if we get down to some of these where we have hummocky cross stratification in some beds, current ripples, wave ripples, some of these are turbidites, some of these are storm beds. I just chose like a couple of parts of examples. In these, you don't actually necessarily have to go the shale. I should say the shale represents the lowest flow speed, right? And then you have these sort of jumps up in flow speed for the various beds. So, and those represent sort of short-term intervals of faster flow. So you could draw sort of dots or you could draw lines coming out for each one. An alternative uh, could be to, to draw, draw an average. So, you know, you could through here say that the average flow speed is a little bit higher because it has more sand beds. Then you go down to uh, mostly mudstone with a few spikes in flow speed coming up representing those sandstone beds. Or you could you could draw it as an average. Um, and these these sharp variations in flow speed in this example we would have some of them are storms. Uh, some of them are turbidites um, coming and going, causing these, these variations in, uh, in flow speed. Look at um, the water level, the interpretation of, of uh, this 
bit of stratigraphy is that it's a river channel. So basically we have a river channel and then um, we have the choice of whether this coal is land and the shale is land or floodplain or lake. And in this little bit, I don't really know. Uh, we will make the uh, coal be on the floodplain and, um, and um, the mudstone, for example, in a lake. Okay. So in this particular case, there's a big abrupt shift between the sandstone and the finer grains on, on either side. So the causes of the abrupt change would be, uh, for example, migration uh, of the channel. Right, or you could say for if for the lake, if it's an oxbow lake, you could say abandonment of uh, the river channel to be become a lake. Uh, if we look at the the next one down, um, uh, these two directions of flow suggest tidal uh, flow, um, and then we have some mudstones with isolated pebbles. Those isolated pebbles, if they're drop stone require some standing water uh, for those large stones to be transported by glaciers or, or by icebergs out into the water. Um, so for those, we could say that um, they're somewhat deeper marine. We come up to a tidal sort of environment, maybe at sea level. And then we have this question about whether this diamigtite is actually deposited on land or uh, in a shallow marine environment. Um, and we don't really have enough information. So like if the glacier extends out over the standing water, it can create a, a diamectite. So here we have either sort of shallow marine somewhere in here or land here. All right. And we don't really know which one of those it is. Um, there aren't necessarily abrupt changes, but, um, but one of the changes in the facies that you could add if it does go all the way to land would be to say ice advances to get that dynamic type. Okay. So if we go down into this environment, um, we can't actually see, so let's see. So at sea level here, so the beach is right very close to sea level. The breaker zone is just a little bit deeper. And, um, uh, and then we have the waves going shallow marine here and the plants indicate uh, land, right? Right. So, so right at this environmental change, let me let me draw this a little bit more. Right, we have we have this abrupt change here, and it doesn't actually go through the river and lake. Uh, the lines don't necessarily tell you, but you can say this abrupt change is going from uh, beach uh, to land with the plants. So for the storm deposits, um, we have some choices here below SWB stands for storm wave base between fair weather wave base and storm weather wave base or shallow marine. So we're obviously above a uh, storm weather wave base, but we don't necessarily know um, just from this section if we're above fair weather wave base or not. So, you know, we'd be somewhere, somewhere uh, in, in this zone generally, All right? So you could sort of fill it in or provide two lines, whatever, whatever you feel like, uh, however you want to show that uncertainty. Now, interestingly, the sea level doesn't significantly change, um, when there's a storm versus when there's not a storm because it's a periodic event. And that's the case. Uh, with these these rocks down here and we're getting a little bit of storm and a little bit of waves 
So we know from those that we are um, above storm wave base, but there's a lot of shale, so we're probably below the fair weather wave base where waves really frequently influence the, influence the sediment. So again, you have these events that represent storms, but probably the whole environment down to where we have the wave ripples here is above uh, storm wave base to get those big um, ripples. When we get to deeper water here, we just have the, the turbidites, and so we're not seeing any evidence of storms, so there's probably some transition here into an environment that's below storm, weather, storm wave base because there, there, there are no storms. You're not seeing any influence of the storms. So that's why I'm interpreting this as, as going deeper. So it could be deeper water, or it could be that uh, climate has changed and there are fewer uh, large storms. So let's zoom out just a little bit here and, and look at this overall section. All right. So the difference in flow speeds, the flow speeds um, can change when you have events, but sea level, those events don't necessarily mean that sea level changes. Um, there are a lot of times when there's uncertainty in uh, the um, uh, sea level, and you can show that by drawing a couple of lines like I did here, saying it's either land or at sea level, or here where I sort of filled in the whole range, and you, either of those is okay. Um, and this this sort of interpretation of the change in sea levels, one of the things that, that really helps us um, reconstruct environments and it will help with the sequence stratigraphy, which is using sea level changes in different columns, uh, the relative sea level change to understand how to correlate columns across environments in time with sequence stratigraphy. Thanks for watching.